today is the 64th day of the Battle of Verdun. The French counterattack on the east bank of the Meuse continued today. Some ground was lost at the Morcom, and German advances were reported at Waikamar, mainly due to the use of landmines and flame guns by troops under General von Galwitz. Casualties, although not yet disclosed, are believed to be heavy on both sides, but the French High Command continues to be optimistic about the chances of an offensive on the Somme no later than mid-June. In the meantime, heavy trench fighting is reported near Suchet, and at Arras and Ypres, British troops are pinned down under an intensive artillery barrage. No new German advances have been made, however, and a statement issued by the war office says we are holding our own. And that's the end of the news for today, April the 23rd, Easter Sunday, 1916. And now the week's special topic introduced by Ray McAnally. Good evening. Now, the following announcement appeared in today's Sunday Independent. Owing to the very critical position, all orders given to the Irish volunteers for tomorrow, Easter Sunday, are hereby rescinded, and no parades, marches, or other movements of the Irish volunteers will take place. Each individual volunteer will obey this order in every particular. No parades, marches, or other movements. A very roundabout way of saying maneuvers, if indeed that is what this announcement means. But does it? And what is the connection between this newspaper item and certain startling events off the Kerry coast over the past few days? This evening, we take a close look at Sinn Féin, and we ask ourselves, what is this organization? Who are its leaders? What are their aims? And why have the government not taken action against them for treasonable activities and parades marches and so-called maneuvers are one thing, but consorting and planning with the Germans is quite another. Strong words? Well, we shall see. These pictures were taken at 9.25 a.m. yesterday from the deck of the naval sloop Bluebell outside Queenstown Harbor. We are watching the last moments of the Oud, a tramp steamer flying the Norwegian flag. Ten minutes after those dramatic pictures were taken, the Oud plunged to the bottom of the ocean, carrying with her a cargo of arms and ammunition. For the Oud was no ordinary merchant vessel. Her crew, when taken aboard HMS Bluebell, were dressed in German naval uniforms. And her commander, now identified as Lieutenant Karl Spindler of the Imperial Naval Reserve, scuttled his vessel sooner than face capture by Bluebell and her sister sloop HMS Zinnia. Now, the Oud was first seen here in Tralee Bay on Holy Thursday afternoon. That night, she dropped anchor off Inish Tushkert and waited as if for a signal. But if so, that signal never came. At 1 a.m. on Good Friday, she was sighted and fired upon by the armed trawler L Lord Hennage. And the chase began. In a few hours, the Oud was overtaken by Bluebell and Zinnia, who ordered her to follow them into Queenstown Harbor. But off Queenstown, and with escape out of the question, Lieutenant Spindler sent his ship to the bottom. What, what went wrong? Why was there no reception committee waiting for the old at the rendezvous point in Tralee Bay? Why were the rebel arms and ammunition not put ashore as planned? We do not know. But at dawn on Good Friday, a dramatic discovery was made at Banner Strand, deep in Tralee Bay. Mr. McCarthy, it was you who found this collapsible boat. It was, I found it. Will you tell us how you found it? Well, I was going along the strand, you see, to the Holy Well to say a few prayers. The Holy Well? No, where's that? It's across there. I woke up and I remember the day it was. Good Friday. I saw and I said to myself, John, to be fit and for you to rise up now and go to the Holy Well and say a few prayers for the sake of yourself and the Holy Souls. Are you in the habit of doing this? I got no, I never did it in my life before. And what happened? Well, I saw this yoke floating there going out with the tide. 
I couldn't handle it on my own, so I went for Pat Driscoll, and he came, and the two was dragged it in. And then you went for the police? Well, you see, there was what you might call a knife in it, one of them daggers. In the boat? Yes, and here in the sand near us was a box tied up with twine, and there was bullets in it, ammunition-like. And then what you think we saw? Only the young one, the child there. Your daughter? Yes, she was up the strand playing with something. And what was in it? Only guns. Three guns, and I wouldn't mind, but they were loaded. Three revolvers, you mean? The police took them. God bless us, but tis dangerous times. I suppose to the men dropped them. Men? What men? Oh, I never clapped eyes them. All I saw was the footmarks in the sand. They went up that way. So I told Patrick to go to the barracks, and he did. And they came, and they went off with the guns, and the ammunition, and the dagger. Three hours later, there came news of an arrest. We interviewed Sergeant Thomas Hearn at McKenna's Fort, a ruined castle near Banner Strand. Information received. Constable Riley and myself instigated a search of the district. At a few minutes before 1 p.m., the constable discovered a man crouching at this spot. Like myself, Constable Riley was armed and threatened to shoot the man if he did not surrender. The man replied, that's a nice way to treat an English visitor. I'm not armed, you know. I won't do you any harm. I then arrived upon the scene and asked the man what he was doing here. I noted that his boots and trouser legs were covered in sand. On searching his person, I discovered a piece of paper on which there was writing in a language unknown to myself. The man claimed that he had never seen it before. I then took him into custody. Five sovereigns. And 11 shillings. Make out a receipt. Uh, wait. Uh, telephone Tralee and tell them what has happened and about these papers. Ask for further instructions. This is our for barracks. I'm going to speak to the barracks in Tralee. You say your name is Richard Morton? Yes. From Denham in Buckinghamshire? Yes. What kind of work do you do? You have no authority to question me. Under the defence regulations, I have all the authority I need or I'm likely to need. Now, I asked you what kind of work you did. I am a writer. A writer of books? Yes. Such as what? I've written a life of St. Brendan, the navigator, among other works. Have you now? What are you doing here at Banner Strand? Walking. Taking the air, is that it? If you like. How do you account for this paper having been found in your possession? I told you, I never saw it before. There is writing on it in a foreign language. There may well be. Would you look at it and tell me? Is it German, do you think? I have no idea. What about these? What about them? Constable Riley and myself saw you attempt to dispose of these typewritten sheets as we were leaving McKenna's fort. You are mistaken. I show them to you. As you can see, groups of numerals have been typed up as a certain words and phrases. Those papers have nothing to do with me. Would you not say that these numerals indicate some kind of code? I'm not an authority on these matters. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have received certain instructions from my superiors. You are to be transferred into the custody of the Tralee Constabulary. But this is No ridiculous. further questioning will take place at this time. We are fortunate in having with us in the studio Sir Matthew Nathan, His Majesty's Under Secretary for Ireland. Good evening, Sir Matthew. Uh, about this man who calls himself Richard Morton, uh, can you throw any light on his arrest or what he may have been up to? Yeah, I think so, yes. In the first place, he came ashore not from the vessel which was subsequently sunk off Queenstown, but from a German submarine. Oh. 
Secondly, his name is not Richard Morton. I regret to have to tell you that he has been identified as Sir Roger Casement. What? You may remember Casement was knighted about five years ago for his services to the Crown, which makes the wretched affair all the more distressing. Well, it, it seems incredible. Surely, Sir Matthew, there has been some... There must have been some mix-up in the identification. Oh, none at all. We are not in the habit of making mistakes, you know. Well, then, are you of the opinion that uh, Sir Roger is implicated Well, in... it's really not for me to say. However, the wretched facts speak for themselves. Well, where is Sir Roger being held? The gentleman in question is at the moment on his way to the Tower of London. Ah, does that mean that the charge is going to be one of high treason? Well, I should expect so, naturally. Is it true, uh, Sir Matthew, that an attempt was made to secure Sir Roger's release? Well, as a matter of fact, yes, by a person called Stack, who is also now in custody. Tell me, uh, Sir Matthew, this attempted arms landing, uh, do you see any connection between that and the Irish volunteers? Oh, yes, most certainly. Uh, you think the arms were intended for them? Well, there is no doubt of it. To be put to what use, would you say? What use uh, does one make of guns and explosives? Obviously, it was the intention of these Sinn Feiners, as they call themselves, to commit various acts of armed aggression. Would you rule out the possibility of a full-scale uprising? Well, yes, I would be inclined to. For all the seditious intentions, these people are numerically weak, and any attempt at a major rebellion would be almost certainly doomed to failure. And I think they must know that themselves. And then the sinking of this armed ship must make uh, even an attempt at rebellion now out of the question. Tell me, Sir Matthew, why have the authorities not taken action against these people? Well, for several reasons. Uh, mainly because up to the present, these Sinn Feiners have presented no real threat. And uh, I have always felt it absolutely vital to avoid any action which might interfere with or upset the government's recruiting drive. I have impressed as much on Lord Wimborne, our Lord Lieutenant. Ah, oh, well, uh, does that mean that Lord Wimborne favoured taking action against the Sinn Feiners? Well, well I, I did not say that. The Lord Lieutenant and myself have always seen eye to eye. Yes, but surely a connection has now been established between these Sinn Feiners and the German government. Now, surely that puts a slightly different complexion on things. Oh, yes, most certainly it does. We are keeping a close watch on these people, despite the fact that the sinking of this Oud must now have drawn their sting. Yes, but are you going to take any positive action, such as arresting the leaders? Uh, well, I am seeing Major Price the head of army intelligence tomorrow morning. After the meeting, I hope to issue a statement. Thank you, Sir Matthew. The Sinn Feiners. Well, who are they? They're really two separate organizations. On the one hand, the Irish Citizen Army, the armed branch of the Irish trade unions, the Dublin trade unions, under union organizer James Connolly. On the other hand, the Irish volunteers under Republican leadership with whom they are working hand in hand. But working towards what mutual aim? And what is the story behind this announcement in today's Sunday Independent? Was, in fact, an armed rebellion planned for today, Easter Sunday, 1916? And is this intended as a notice to say that that rebellion would not now take place. Well, a few days ago, we were informed that Patrick H. Pierce, a Rathfarnham schoolmaster and director of organization of the Irish volunteers, had actually issued orders for an armed insurrection without the knowledge or consent of his chief of staff, Professor Owen McNeill. Well, now, if true, this was surely a classic example of the left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing. Now, late on Thursday night of this week, our camera team was at St. Enders in Rathfarnham in an unsuccessful attempt to interview Mr. Pierce, who was not available for comment. However, at 1 a.m. on Friday morning, we did succeed in having a word with one of Mr. Pierce's late night callers. Pat Nolan reports. This is Pat Nolan speaking from the grounds of St. Enders School, Rathfarnham, home of Mr. P.H. Pierce, or Commandant Pierce, as he is known within the Irish Volunteers. A few minutes ago, Mr. Pierce had what seemed to be unexpected visitors in the persons of Professor Owen McNeill, Mr. Bulmer Hobson, Secretary of the Irish Volunteers, and two other men whom we could not identify. 
Now, Mr. Pierce has declined to say a few words to our camera, but we are hanging on here in the chill of this Good Friday morning in the hopes that Professor McNeil may be more forthcoming as to the future activities of the Irish volunteers. Stand by, they're coming out. Very well, then. You were deceived, but it was necessary. I refuse to have hundreds of lives on my conscience. McNeil! I warn you, Pierce. I give you my word. I'll do everything, apart from ringing up Dublin Castle itself. That's all I've got to say to you. Professor McNeil. Who's there? Would you care to make a statement? A statement? What about? Well, for one thing, have mobilization orders been issued to the volunteers? Who said so? There are rumors. Never mind about the rumors. I want to know who said it. Well, no one exactly, but in view of... Then I have no statement to give. Professor McNeil. By noon yesterday, Lawler Shop in Found Street was completely sold out of bandoliers, water bottles, bayonets, swords and belts. Chemist shops everywhere in Dublin report to run on bandages and first aid kits. Would you care to comment? Am I supposed to have bought all these articles? No, sir, but they were bought by members of the Irish Volunteers. Indeed. <laughs> I see nothing extraordinary about that. The Volunteers are under standing orders to attend their parades properly equipped. Are you saying that no mobilization is planned? I am. The idea is preposterous. There will be no rising? Certainly not. May I ask, then, why you called on General Pierce this evening? On a matter to do with the uh, administration. At one in the morning. Well, why not? Do you expect us to keep bankers' hours? Is it true that you and General Pierce have quarreled Quarrel? on a point? Certainly not. Well, then, has your visit anything to do with the castle document? Document? Professor McNeil, on Wednesday, a document was made public which is alleged to have been copied from the files of Dublin Castle. If genuine, it is a directive for the arrest of the Irish volunteers and the occupation of Liberty Hall and other premises, including the Archbishop's house. Yes, I know all about that. Professor McNeil, do you believe the document to be authentic? No, I... You uh... don't sound definite, Professor. Well, I'm inclined to... Professor McNeil, you are known to have stated that you would be in favour of a rising if any attempt was made to disarm or arrest the Irish volunteers. Well? In view of the publication of this document... I have document, nothing further to say. Good night. Was the alleged Castle document a forgery perpetrated by Professor McNeil's colleagues and intended to influence him in favour of an insurrection? Well, we shall see. Meanwhile, since Thursday night, Mr. Pierce has had other visitors, among them the O'Rahilly, treasurer of the Irish Volunteers, and, like Professor Owen McNeil, known to be opposed to any act of armed rebellion in the present circumstances. On Friday morning, Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and Sean McDermott visited the professor at his home in Rathfarnham. After a second visit, this time from Sean McDermott alone, we spoke again to Professor McNeil. Yes? Professor McNeil, we learn you've had visits from Mr. Pierce and other volunteer leaders. May we ask what was discussed? I have no statement to give. Was the possibility of an armed insurrection discussed? I have no statement. Do you still believe the Castle document to be a forgery? I... No, I do not. You now think it is genuine? Yes. Uh... I have come to that conclusion. May I ask, what changed your mind? Was it as a result of discussions you've had with... Are you now in favour of a rising? On Saturday, the news of the odd sinking became known and Professor McNeil learned news of another kind. We spoke to him for a third time. Professor McNeil, we learned that an arms vessel has been sunk off the Cork coast. Do you have any comment? I have only one thing to say to you. This castle document, as it's called, I've now learned beyond all doubt that it is a forgery. Yes, but yesterday you I said was, was misled and deceived. The document is bogus. Do you know who forged it? Would you say that the sole purpose of this document was to force you to sanction an uprising? There will be no rising. Late last night, Mr. Pierce left St. Enders for Dublin. His present whereabouts are unknown, but he is believed to be staying with friends. Earlier this morning, one of our interviewers spoke to Mr. T.J. Clark, believed to be one of the leaders of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Mr. Clark, a native of Dungannon, served 15 years in prison for his part in the Clannangale dynamite plot of the 1880s. Mr. Clark. Yes? Have you any comment on Professor McNeil's announcement in the Sunday Independent? Announcement? I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then you might like to read it. 
Hmm? Oh. I don't believe it. Well, I knew that McNeil was... Well, why would he do a thing like that? The blackguard. The dirty blackguard. Well, there you have it. Was an insurrection planned for today? We may never know for certain. But in view of the gravity of the events and their implications, we asked Lord Wimborne earlier today if he would consent to speak to our reporter, Maury Taylor, at the Vice Regal Lodge. Lord Wimborne, thank you for agreeing to talk to us. Perhaps you, better than anyone else, can answer this question. If the Oud had not sunk, would there have been an uprising? Well, no one can really say, except the people for whom the German guns were destined. But in any event, the authorities would not have been unprepared. We know our men, and I think we know how to deal with them. You think they should have been sentenced to penal servitude? Not necessarily. My own personal inclinations would be to conscript them. Send these young bloods off to the Western Front, put them in the army, give them a war worth fighting. With all the hotheads out in France, there wouldn't be anyone left here in Ireland worth bothering about. Of course, Mr. Birrell, Chief Secretary for Ireland, he doesn't quite feel as I do. Oh? No, not at all. Both he and the undersecretary here, Sir Matthew Nathan, have felt for some time that the Irish question would solve itself. As it seems to have done. What would you say, so? Well, with the sinking of the hour. No, 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 I disagree. This hour business is the first real proof that's come into our hands. We are at war with Germany, you know. And now, at last, we can charge these Sinn Feiners with hostile association with the enemy. Do you intend to do so? I should rather not make any comment just at present. Let me say merely that steps are being contemplated. To conclude the interview, Lord Wimburn had this to say. This has been a most disturbing time for us all. While their fellow Irishmen are gallantly fighting in France for king and country, a number of misguided and foolish people have engaged in a plot against the crown. But thanks to the vigilance of His Majesty's government, what might have been a serious reflection on the loyalty of the people of Ireland has now been averted. Let me assure you that this vigilance will not be deflected. In the meantime, go about your business in full confidence. Be calm, pursue the pleasures and pastimes of this holiday season. There will be no rising.